Good morning, everyone. It is day five of Women's Health Week, and this morning we are talking all things pregnancy with Christiana Care OBGYN, Dr. Lindsay Davis. Dr. Davis, thanks so much for being here this morning. Please take a minute to introduce yourself. Good morning, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Lindsay Davis. I'm one of the OBGYNs with Greenville OBGYN at Christiana Care. And you know, there are a million things we could talk about. You've joined us live before. We had that entire pregnancy series. So we'll keep this to a half hour, I promise. But if you have, if you're watching and have any questions, please submit them in the comments and we will get to them during our conversation. But during this conversation, we will try to cover as much as we can for you if you just wanna sit and listen. Dr. Davis, we'll start big picture. What's the most important thing you want women to understand about pregnancy? Sure. Thanks, Megan. That's a great question. And I think so many things for consideration. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about today is I really want to bring to light and recognize how significantly our bodies are changing in pregnancy. I don't know that that gets as much playtime or recognition in all of, you know, the maternity books and some of the podcasts. And I think that just kind of stepping back and realizing, and we can talk a little bit about what some of those big picture and major changes are happening in our body. Things like our overall blood volume is increasing by over 50%, which means that our heart is having to work so much harder to be able to get all of that fluid that both to baby and to all of our vital organs. Um, things like blood pressure issues can become a, a problem in up to 10% of women. Other things are that our immune system can become weakened because it's trying to account for us growing a, a baby and, and that that can take a lot of um, toll on our body. And that's one of the reasons why it's important for us to get vaccinated to help to give our immune system a boost. And then also trying to do all of those good things with healthy eating and taking care of our bodies to keep us well in pregnancy. And I just think that so many times that we might set these expectations that pregnancy is this perfectly magical, blissful, natural, normal period. And having the recognition of the degree to which our body is working and changing, I think, helps to set the tone for women to be able to understand, okay, it's okay for me to take a break. And having more grace with our body and just recognizing the amazing things that our body's doing, but knowing that there might be a few bumps along that pregnancy road. Absolutely. So if a woman takes an at-home pregnancy test and it's positive, obviously there's a million things that she's thinking about that she thinks she should be doing. You know, what are those key things that she should do, you know, start thinking about as soon as that happens? Absolutely. So, you know, hopefully that a woman's been thinking about pregnancy before she conceives and hopefully she's been taking a prenatal vitamin. But if she hasn't been on a prenatal vitamin yet, then going ahead and starting that as soon as we have that positive pregnancy test. And that's because prenatal vitamins contain the amount of folic acid that our body needs, which is a vitamin that's going to help to develop the baby's skull and spine. And a lot of that development can actually happen before we have the positive home pregnancy test. Other things are starting to make those modifications of when we talk about diet and what sorts of changes that we're making in pregnancy and avoiding harmful substances, things like alcohol or tobacco use. We, we really want to avoid those when we're attempting to conceive because as we said for, you know, usually the first two weeks from the time that conceptions occurred, um, that it's going to take a little bit of time for us to realize that we're, that we're pregnant and have that positive urine pregnancy test. So making all of those healthy changes. Once we do become pregnant, we want to avoid certain foods. And you know, we, we have our whole series of understanding and eating well for pregnancy. Um, so if, if women are interested in logging on so that we can talk about a whole hour of what sort of dietary changes can be helpful. But the big things are going to be avoiding raw and undercooked meats and eggs because of that weakened immune system that not only are we more prone to having GI illness, um, but there can also be harmful bacteria that could impact a developing fetus. Things that maybe women don't think about quite as much are 
avoiding deli meats and hot dogs until they're warmed up to a steaming hot temperature because they can contain a certain bacteria called listeria um, that can be harmful to a developing baby. And that's a bacteria that can still survive even in refrigeration. Um, so, so that's why it's really important for us to be able to make sure that we're um, starting to read about and, and starting to make some of those changes, ideally even before we're pregnant, um, but, but then being able to implement those things absolutely once we, once we have that pregnancy test. So you mentioned our Understanding and Eating for Pregnancy series. We actually have a recording of one of your most recent ones that we can put in the chat um, okay. for anyone who is interested in kind of watching that now. And then we'll also obviously be, be promoting your next class as well. So from the last two questions, you mentioned a whole lot happens and that first trimester is certainly can be the hardest. Do you have any tips for getting through that first trimester, especially if someone is you know, hit with that morning sickness right away? Right, absolutely. So the most common symptoms in the first trimester are usually feeling nauseous, perhaps having some episodes of vomiting, and then the fatigue. And so things that can be helpful with nausea and vomiting in pregnancy, I, I always say knowing that there's light at the end of the tunnel is helpful because sometimes people think, oh my gosh, is this going to last forever? How am I going to get through this? And, and most women are going to start to feel better beyond 10, 12, 14 weeks time. But things that can help with nausea and vomiting in pregnancy are to try and eat small, frequent meals throughout the day rather than aiming for three large meals. That helps to keep our blood sugars a little bit more even throughout the day and helps to decrease um, the amount of spikes and hence some of the nausea that can come on when we have low blood sugars. Um, incorporating something like a ginger or peppermint tea or candies can be helpful as well and soothe the stomach. And then talking to your physician about incorporating something like a vitamin B6 supplement um, and some other, other over-the-counter remedies can be helpful, or there are also prescription medications that can help um, with nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. So, so knowing that there's lots of options. With the fatigue aspect, I'd say, First, knowing that that's common in pregnancy, but we also wanna be screening for other sorts of things like anemia, um, which is where we can have a low blood count. And that can be more common in pregnancy, especially as we get further along. So following up soon with your physician um, or your OB provider and being able to have those baseline prenatal labs to ensure that there's no concern for infection that we're otherwise, you know, starting off with a healthy pregnancy. And then once we've kind of ruled out other causes, that pregnancy itself can certainly be um, very taxing on our body. And so again, just allowing that space for us to be able to rest when we need to rest, sleep when we need to sleep. And at what point should you call your doctor about symptoms? So if you're, and you know, pregnant women talk to other pregnant women, they have friends who maybe were pregnant within the last couple of years. And sometimes even when you Google things, everything is like, oh, that's normal. Oh, it's fine. Oh, I had that. But at what point do you say, you know what, maybe I should call? Yeah, well, I think that the first rule of thumb is just being in tune with your body. And then if something doesn't feel right, Call your, call your provider. Um, there are a lot of changes that our body is going through. And, and some of those major ones are going to be our baseline, the, the way that we take in breaths, that we're going to have faster, more shallow breaths. And that's why pregnant women feel short of breath and can, and can become short of breath more easily. That being said, that should get better with rest. And if it's something that is becoming a bothersome symptom, you should talk to your provider about it. Our, our heart rate is changing as well. Um, our resting heart rate is going to go up in pregnancy. That's that heart working harder to get out enough blood flow um, to our brain and to the placenta and to baby and all of those other necessary organs. Um, but sometimes we can feel that heart, that heart rate going up. And sometimes we can have things like palpitations where we feel our heart racing. There are some things that can be normal. There are some things that are not normal with the way that that can happen. And so if it's something that we're feeling um, symptomatic with it, we should certainly reach out to our provider. Absolutely. That's so important. And another big question women have kind of on top of everything else is weight gain. 
you know, what is considered kind of a, a normal weight gain? Is there a normal weight gain? Right. So those recommendations are going to be based on, first of all, what type of pregnancy do we have? Are we having just one baby? Are we having twins or multiples? Because the amount of weight that we need to gain is going to be to help to support those that developing baby or babies. Um, and then it also depends on what our starting body weight is. And we use something called um, BMIs, our body mass index. That's based on what our height and our weight are. And it's a over, it's a very general measure, but something that helps us to have a better sense of, is this an appropriate weight or potentially are we a little bit, have more weight that we don't need to gain quite as much in pregnancy. Overall, um, what's absolutely necessary is about 10 to 15 pounds that accounts for developing each individual baby um, at full term, that placenta, the amniotic fluid, and then things like breast tissue that are added, and that can take up to about one to two extra pounds. Recommendations for women who are starting off at a normal body mass index for just a single 10, one baby pregnancy is gaining 25 to 35 pounds. But women who have are starting off at a higher body mass index can be anywhere from, depending on where exactly that is, um, 11 to 25 pounds. But those are things that should be discussed with your provider regarding what is a healthy starting weight, weight gain for you individually. So speaking of weight gain, a lot of what women do to kind of prevent that before they get pregnant is exercise. Mm -hmm. Obviously, once you get pregnant, that exercise changes, or maybe it doesn't. You know, I know someone six months pregnant who just ran a half marathon. I was not one of those pregnant women, but some people are more power to them. Um, so what is your advice for monitoring or adjusting that exercise once you get pregnant? Right. So in general, whatever our baseline activity is prior to pregnancy is typically going to be safe to continue through pregnancy, but always discussing that with your provider. We do want to stay active. Ideally, women should be getting 150 minutes of exercise per week. And a lot of women that can be broken down into about 30 minutes, um, five days out of the week. And, and that doesn't have to be, I mean, sometimes, you know, we have either we feel tired or we have really busy schedules and how do we find a half an hour in the day to be able to exercise? So keeping in mind that it, it doesn't have to be in one setting. I like to tell a lot of patients, you know, trying to just break it up into 10 minutes um, in the morning, afternoon and evening of just going for a vigorous walk. And we want that moderate aerobic activity. So something that we should still be able to be active and hold a conversation, but something that does help to get our heart rate slightly up. Um, as we get further along in pregnancy and as the uterus starts to weigh more, usually after about 20 weeks, um, once we're more than halfway through, roughly halfway through the pregnancy, we want to avoid laying flat on our back for an extended period of time. So we're not going to want to do regular some yoga positions or Pilates positions. So talking to your provider about what would be appropriate um, activities at that point in time, but knowing that we do want women to stay active because that's going to be best for them staying well and also helpful for baby's health. So what I've been hearing throughout all of these answers is talk to your individual provider about your individual situation. Exactly, because we're all different. <laughs> so one of the tests everyone will take um, in that second trimester is the gestational diabetes screen. So talk a little bit about what that is, what that means, mm -hmm. and how women could or should prepare for that. Absolutely. So as we said, our, our body's going through monumental changes, right? And there's things that are beyond our control. Um, that some of those hormonal changes that are happening are not things that we can really change. And, and one of the hormonal changes is something that makes it more difficult for our body to process blood sugar that is meant to help baby to grow, but sometimes it might overcompensate and lead to a condition called gestational diabetes. So all women, regardless of risk factors, should be screened for gestational diabetes and pregnancy. And that can be done any time between 24 until 28 weeks. Now, the screening test, what we call um, the glucose challenge test, 
there's really not much that you need to do to prepare for that. It, it does take an hour. So knowing that you need to carve out an hour of your time when you, it's not a fasting test. So you can eat and drink normally leading up to the test. Try not to have a ton of sugar before you go in because when you go into the lab, they will give women a large glucose load. It's a super sugary drink. And an hour later, check to see what the glucose level, the, the blood sugar level is. And that tells us whether a woman is at a higher or lower risk of developing something like gestational diabetes. If that test is normal, then we typically just move on with routine prenatal care. Mm -hmm. If the screening test is abnormal, then we follow up with a three hour um, glucose um, tolerance test. And that is going to be a fasting test. So nothing to eat or drink for eight hours before the test. Once you go to the lab to have that assessment, it's an even larger sugary drink that they will give you. Nothing to eat or drink for that entirety of the three hours. And they're going to take four values, your fasting level, and then each blood sugar level on the hour for the following three hours. And that's going to be diagnostic to tell us whether or not a woman definitively has gestational diabetes. So I know a lot of women, if they're diagnosed with gestational diabetes, automatically think like, oh my God, this is my fault and I did something wrong. But in all reality, it's placenta-based, right? It is, it is. We blame that, that placenta and the hormones that the placenta is releasing. And just knowing that, um, you know, to, that there is, is, are things that we cannot keep that from happening, but it's important to follow up on that testing because once it's recognized and diagnosed, then there are things that we can do in terms of monitoring and making appropriate dietary changes. And sometimes when necessary, adding medications. So it is a condition that can be well controlled once we know that it's there. Absolutely. Another big buzzword in pregnancy is preeclampsia. So give us a bit of a rundown of, of what that is, how it happens and what that means for pregnancy. Absolutely right. So that's one of those conditions that really can cause a lot of difficulty for mom or for baby or cause a lot of risk for mom and for baby. Preeclampsia is a condition where we have elevated blood pressures that are impacting other organs. Um, and, and those include organs like our kidney, our liver, um, our brain, and the placenta, meaning what's, what's getting to baby and providing all of the oxygen and nutrients that they need to grow. Um, about 10%, we mentioned earlier, 10% of women will develop some degree of blood pressure issues in pregnancy. And that is why OB providers are constantly monitoring for, for blood pressures and for signs or symptoms of things like preeclampsia. Symptoms of now preeclampsia, if it's going to develop, it's more in the second half of pregnancy um, that those blood pressures can start to go up and can start to have other impacts on the body. Signs and symptoms of preeclampsia are going to be if a woman develops an irretractable severe headache, and it can be often associated with some visual changes like seeing spots or seeing um, flashes of light. Um, is, a, is a sign of how our, our brain can be impacted by some of those changes. Our kidney function can start to decrease. Our liver function might not work the same. So those are things if we're having blood pressure issues, it's important to have close follow-up or if we're having concerns with severe headaches, visual changes, sometimes pain up our un pain underneath our right rib cage are all reasons that we should be following up with our OB provider. And, and that is something that, you know, for years, OBGYNs have been trying to figure out what causes this, what's the root issue for why women develop this. And we're learning more and more day by day. But now what's fantastic is that we do have an ability to help to decrease that risk by adding things like a daily baby aspirin in pregnancy. And, you know, there's certain women who are going to have more risk factors um, who should be on either that da daily baby aspirin or sometimes even a double strength of that. Again, it should be something that's discussed with an, with an OB provider for if you should be taking it, how much you should be taking it. But luckily in our high risk women, taking a daily baby aspirin can decrease the risk of preeclampsia by up to roughly 50%. 
That's great. And even if you're not having symptoms, at least at the Christiana care practices, your blood pressure is checked at every appointment. So it's something that obviously you guys are keeping an eye on as well. So speaking of Christiana Care, please take a minute before I let you go to talk about your practice and the other providers at your practice and how wonderful you all are. Oh, thank you so much, Megan. So my practice is Greenville OBGYN. We are currently made up of seven female physicians. We have one of our midwives, our great nurse practitioner and a physician's assistant. And the thing that we love about our group is how well everybody works together. Um, I'd say, you know, the entire department of OBGYN at Christiana is really fantastic. But if patients are looking for a new OB provider, um, you can go to our website. We have our, our phone number listed. You can reach out. We're going to be starting to do self-scheduling so patients can always schedule online or call to make an appointment. Um, but I think one of the most important things when you're looking for your, your care during pregnancy is finding a provider that you feel comfortable talking to, because there are going to be a lot of things that come up in pregnancy, and you want to make sure that you're feeling heard in some of those concerns, and you want to make sure that you're able to have that easy communication and conversation about what's happening in pregnancy. So talk a little bit about how that works in your practice, because full disclosure, you guys delivered my baby and I think you're awesome, um, but I saw everybody. So in, I think you're, you're all fantastic. I will vouch for all of you, absolutely. But talk a little bit about how you have a relationship with, with really everyone in your practice. Yeah, so we do. We work together as a team because there's so much, you know, delivering babies is a 24 seven job. And not one person can be there all the time. And most, you know, we see more women in OBGYN and everybody has their kids at home. You know, plenty of providers have their families and things that it's hard to be there all the time. So that's where we work together as a team um, that we're generally going to be in the hospital you know, sharing call and having one day that we're there. And so that's why we like to have our patients rotate to be able to meet everybody in the practice. Um, and then that way, if somebody goes into labor in the middle of the night, then you have a familiar face who you've met. Um, I'd say what's really important in that type of setting is being able to have the communication among the providers as well. And so so that's why it really is teamwork um, to be able to talk about, okay, so this is what's going on and, and helping to get things set up that need to be followed up on and making sure that everybody's feeling comfortable with um, a, a group and a team as a whole. Absolutely. Dr. Davis, thank you so much for being here today and sharing all that information. And if you are watching and still have questions for Dr. Davis, please leave those in the comments of this Facebook Live, and we'll be able to chat with you in the comments after this live wraps. And if you need any more information about women's health and OBGYN here at Christiana Care, you can check links in the comments as well. Thanks so much and have a great day.